introduce to you really quick because I want to give him time to speak a, a, a great uh, privilege that we have this morning having with us. His name is Pastor Aaron Calhoun, him and his wife, Felissa. She's down here. He'll introduce you to you in a moment. Um, they are pastoring in Tallahassee, Florida. They've been there for <clears throat> the, a really long tenure. I think it's, what month is it now in 2022? July. So they've been seven months in Tallahassee, planted a church at uh, the very beginning of this year. And uh, one of the reasons I've gotten to know him over the last year a little bit, I'm still getting to know him and just have loved every bit about getting to know him. But why I asked him to come, I was telling him is, I said, I want you to come and just continue to challenge us as a church. That even though the last couple of years, so many things have felt like they're on pause or on hold or unknown, we need to constantly have the reminder that God is not on pause. And specifically, not just God, but his mission that he has called each of us to and to be a part of. God is still wanting to use us and move us for him. And as you know, if you've been here, I've been praying that as Nate and Daisha are leaving for Scotland to become missionaries, that some of you are starting to get the call of God to become a missionary in some place in this world, or maybe even in the U.S., that God is moving on your heart. Because missionaries and pastors get started right where you're sitting. They're not a special group of people born that way, put in a special category. They are just like you, and they answer the call of God. So whether it's to missions or I'm even hoping and praying for some of you will respond like Aaron did to leave his church where he was the college uh, pastor and go to a place he didn't even really know because God told him to go plant a church. There's people here that need a church. And I want our, our church has planted a couple churches over the last uh, time that we've been here, and I'd love to see us plant more. And uh, so I'm praying that today that this message will encourage you, but also challenge some of you maybe to say, I don't know, how, I don't think I'm qualified, I don't know how to do it, but I think that God's speaking to me, and uh, we'd love to come alongside. So I know that you will really enjoy hearing from him today. Him and his wife have been married seven years, packed up everything from Huntsville, Alabama, in the middle of all this in December, and moved to Tallahassee, Florida. You're going to love his story. Would you welcome Aaron up this morning? Good morning, Gettysburg Foursquare. How are we doing this morning? Good. It's so good to be with you all. It's an honor uh, to serve you all from this place today. Again, my name is Aaron Calhoun. Uh, my wife, Melissa, and I, we have been married for uh, seven years, and we have taken a step of faith to leave Huntsville, Alabama, and to move to Tallahassee, Florida, church plant uh, known as Adventure Foursquare Church in Tallahassee, Florida. So we are so honored to be here with you all today. I want to honor uh, Jesus for this moment to preach his word and honor Pastor Mark for the invitation. Thank you, brother. It's an honor to be here in your church to, to teach from the pulpit this morning. So thank you for your trust. And I want to honor Pastor Manny, too. We, uh, we preached in uh, our youth camp this week, and my wife preached as well. And I'm telling you, uh, God is on the move in our next generation. Um, in Christiansburg this week, there were many salvations, many Holy Spirit baptisms, and God saved a lot of students from suicidal thoughts this week. So can we give God praise? He is on the move in the next generation. He's moving powerfully. So let's get to the word of God this morning, church family. Let's go to the Old Testament in 2 Samuel chapter 23, and we're going to read verses 20 through 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23, 20 through 23. I want to welcome those watching online as well. Glad that y'all can join in and experience God's word and God's presence together. So God's word says this. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was the son of a brave man from Kabzeel, a man of many exploits. But Benaiah killed two sons of Ariel of Moab, and he went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. He also killed an Egyptian, an impressive man. Even though the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaiah went down to him with a staff, snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and then killed him with his own spear. Verse 22 says this, these were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehodiah, who had a reputation among the three warriors. He was the most honored of the 30. But he did not become one of the three. David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Let's pray together. God, we come to your word humble and ready and expectant to hear from you. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Make the most of Jesus in our time together. Father, would you help us see your gospel in this Old Testament text today? And that we would see your hearts to transform us and even 
transform us through your heart to send us on your mission. So, Father, I pray that you would speak clearly to us today. Transform us, make us more like Christ. Change the way we think about mission. Help us follow you, Jesus, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We give you glory today in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So, just all transparency, I was really tempted to just preach what I preached at youth camp this week. But as I was praying and preparing for this moment, uh, the Holy Spirit wants to give fresh bread today. Uh, So there's no leftovers today. I believe God has a fresh word from the Holy Spirit for us today in this moment. And so if you're taking notes today, I want you to write down this title I believe God is inviting us into when it comes to joining him in his mission. Get in the pit. Say that with me. Say, get in the pit. Get in the pit. Have you ever known someone who was amazingly yet weirdly courageous and bold to do something downright dangerous for their well-being. My, my grandfather, his name was James, he was a surveyor in Tuskegee, Alabama. And he was one of the first African-American surveyors in that area. And so what he would have to do, he would have to go survey the land to uh, pave out pathways and roads and byways and interstates for cars to drive on in that time. And so my, my grandfather, he would go out into wooded areas and he would have to cut down shrubs, knock down trees, to really pave a path so that he could do his work and survey the land and get, get the right measurements so that we could have, you know, the right measured roads for cars to travel on. Well, my grandfather had two sons, uh, my father, Kelvin, and then my uncle, Kenny. And he would invite Kelvin and Kenny with him into these wooded areas. And they would have tools. They would have uh, uh, sharp uh, items to to chop down trees and and get the the land ready to be surveyed. But but part of that process is that they would come across some interesting wildlife in Tuskegee in the Montgomery area of Alabama. And when I say wildlife, I mean poisonous snakes, like rattlesnakes. (laughs) And they would come across these rattlesnakes quite often. And so they would have to kill these rattlesnakes and go into certain pits of the wooded area to take them out. Now, my grandfather loved the outdoors. I'm kind of cool with the outdoors, but low-key, I hate snakes. I am not as bold as my grandfather when it comes to snakes. Now, I am the oldest of 11 siblings, and uh, my younger biological sister named Rachel, uh, she hates the outdoors. She would have not survived at Camp Pastor, man, if she would not have survived, man. She does not like to be outside. But there was a moment when I was about 16 years old, and I was taking out the trash outside to the little trash bin, and I'm about to put the trash bag in the trash canister, and I see this long, thick, black snake with stripes on it. And I am extremely afraid in that moment. <laughs> I do not like snakes. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a snake. And my little brother, whose name is David, he comes out. He's like, dude, that's a snake. That is so cool. I'm like, that's not cool, bro. What are you talking about? Out of nowhere, my little sister comes outside the screen door. And she comes and looks at the snake. And, like, she's calm. She's collected. She's not, like, scared. She gently goes back into the house, goes down to the basement. She comes out with a shovel, comes back to where the snake were, and me and David are scared, and she bends down, picks up the snake by its tail, walks to the pavement street by our road, puts the snake on the road, and killed the snake. (laughs) Who are you, and what have you done with my little sister? That was incredibly brave of her to take out that snake. And I was shocked at her courageous attitude and actions to get in this scary moment, this, this pit of this snake, and go kill it. I find out that my sister was watching Discovery Channel that week, and they were talking about <laughs> snakes. And she discovered that some snakes are actually harmless. They're actually not poisonous at all. It was actually a little garden snake. So she had the intel and she had the knowledge and the revelation that that snake was no threat at all. Can I invite us, church, into a narrative in the Bible where we see a man in David's mighty men, his his, his army, where he makes some decisions to be courageous and to engage in some exploits. And I want to invite us into a narrative to where I believe God is calling us as sons and daughters of God to get in the pit with Jesus. 
can I encourage you and maybe suggest to you that Jesus is in the pits of our cities and our communities where his light can bring darkness, even if it's a pit. In our context today, this passage of scripture in 2 Samuel 23, we find a very oddly placed story as King David's final words are being uh, explained, and David actually provides for us a, a roster of his mighty men. The, 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 these were David's special forces who went into many battles with David during his reign as the king of Israel. And David's mighty men, when you go back and read the context of King David's story, uh, these are some ragtag group of guys. They, they've gone through some really hard things together. They grieved some loss together. They went on battle with God together in King David's army. And, and then you, you see some of their exploits and their adventures in 2 Samuel 23. This chapter is very similar to Hebrews chapter 11, what we, what we sometimes call the Hall of Faith, which contains many honorable stories of men and women in the Old Testament that put their faith in God and his promises. Well, I, I can I suggest to you that, that 2 Samuel 23, I would call that the Hall of Perseverance. The, these guys persevered and overcame some really intense, crazy battles for the glory of God while they were in King David's army. And through today's scriptures, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to us Christ, his heart of love, his heart of mission, and transformation by the power of the gospel and the reality of the kingdom of God. So we're going to take a look at the actions of Benaiah today and really find out why in the world did Benaiah make intentional decisions to get in the pit. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, are you willing to get in the pit with Jesus? Let's take a look together. Point one, write this down if you're taking notes. The Miyaso Day of God is a transformational invitation to follow Jesus by leaving our comfort zones and joining Jesus in the pit. The, the Miyaso Day of God is a transformational invitation to follow Jesus by leaving our comfort zones and joining Jesus in the pit. The Miyaso Day of God is just simply the mission of God. We serve a sending God. We serve a missional God who is focused on saving and redeeming us, lost, broken humanity from our sin, from death, and eternal destruction. This holy missional aspect of who God is comes from his deep, self-giving, agapeo love, that, that unconditional love. Because, listen, God sent Jesus into our pit of sin, of brokenness. And so if God, who is a sending God, sent Jesus for us, doesn't that make us a sent people as his sons and daughters that he is now sending us to because he's also sent the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to baptize us and empower us with the strength of heaven to go into the pits of earth and bring the whole gospel. Because there are people in pits, if you will, in our families, in our communities, in our cities, in our regions, they need the gospel too. They, they, they need to know this healing power of Jesus. They need to know that we are willing to leave our comfort zones the same way that Jesus left the ultimate comfort of heaven to come into our pits and save us from our sin. We are a sent people because we serve a sending God. So if we look at our text in 2 Samuel, chapter 23, verse 20a, the word says this, Maniah, son of Jehoiada, was the son of a brave man from Habzeel, a man of many exploits or adventures. Maniah killed two sons of Ariel of Moab. Now, th this is a, a powerful uh, uh, early prophetic gospel parallel right here. Benaiah's story and introduction here in the narrative of, of God's mission or the Miyaso Day, but Benaiah is introduced as the son of a brave man from Kabzeel. Now, now, in the Hebrew, Benaiah's name means Yahweh builds up or, or God builds up. And Jehodiah, which was Benaiah's dad, his name in the Hebrew originally means Yahweh knows or God knows. 
Now, it's interesting when the Bible gives us details and we begin to actually dig in to see what is actually being said. When you check out the, the city's name, Kabzia was a remote city in the Judah area. The city's name in the original Hebrew means God gathers. So, so, so check this out. The city he's from is about God gathering. His daddy named him God builds up. And his father's name means God knows. Can I suggest to you that God knows who needs him in their pit, in their struggles, in their hard places, and God wants to send us? his transformed disciples to them in their pits because he knows and he wants to build them up. He knows what they need and God wants to gather them home. And the way God does it is that he invites us into his mission to join him in what he's already doing in our cities, our families, our communities and say, hey, come, come join me in my power. Come join me in my love and let's go rescue some people from some pits because they need my love too. They need the gospel of my son Jesus too. They need the power and the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. Church family, we serve a God who is on an eternal exploit, an eternal adventure to gather us into his family again, to build us up as we share and live the gospel. And can, can I just pause and just remind us of the gospel? I, I think it's important to preach the gospel to ourselves sometimes, that, that, that God sent Jesus into our pits. To, to, to save us, to, 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 to redeem us. And that, that, that becomes our why, our, our, our motivation to go be sent by Jesus into new places and spaces so that they can know the good news too and be saved and filled as well. Who's willing to get in the pit with Jesus? Hallelujah. Okay. All right. Let's, let's, let's keep digging there. All right. So the, the end of verse 20, but, but Benaiah killed two sons of uh, Ariel of Moab. Now, the word Ariel in the Hebrew is extremely difficult to translate. And I'm not going to front, I don't know what it means for real. I, I, I did some research, I did some digging. And like, it, it could mean two small baby lions. It could mean two champions of Moab that were kind of like a, a, a Goliath-type warrior that, that Benaiah was facing. How, how, however the translation is, we see that Benaiah's first exploit as one of David's mighty men, he's taken down and defeating two foes of Moab who were the enemies of Israel. Can I suggest to you that every exploit we're about to study right here, Benaiah is always at a disadvantage. It's two against one. And this dude is literally facing the enemies of Israel. And he is now engaging them in battle, and he ends up defeating them. You know, my, my wife and I, uh, we went through a, a, a four-square uh, church planning uh, cohort called Multiply. And, and during that time, we honestly thought, okay, God, we're going to get equipped to church plant. And we'll, we'll church plant, you know, like 10, 15 years from now. <laughs> right. And, and God begins to stir in our hearts, and he, he, give, he gave me a word last summer. He said, Aaron, soon I'm going to send you to a place you haven't seen and go to a people that you haven't seen before. And it was only my wife and I, no, no team, no one came from us from Restoration Church. Like, it was just my wife and I, and we're going into this area where we are outnumbered, we are outmatched, we have no experience, we have no clue what Tallahassee is about. And can I suggest to you that as we go into the pit and join Jesus in the pit, there will be moments where it seems that we are at a disadvantage. It seems that it doesn't make sense that we would leave a place of comfort. We were on staff at church in the Forest Square Church in Alabama. Like, life was good. We were planted. But then God sends us someplace where we're outmatched. And I think that's the whole point. Because when we're in the pit with Jesus, we experience and encounter the power, the presence, the provision, and the perseverance of Jesus Christ when we join him in the pit. And, and engaging as a church planner, we, we, you, learn, you learn the importance of prayer and spiritual warfare. And can I just encourage the church today that we don't fight from victory, we fight from victory. Jesus achieved the victory for us when he died on the cross and finished the work that he came to do for us. So when we engage in spiritual warfare, when we pray, when we're outnumbered by, by two Ariels from Moab, 
We fight from victory, not for it. Jesus already achieved it for us. We fight from victory, and we stand firm, and we push back darkness in the name of Jesus because we have the victory in Christ. So in the pit, we're equipped, we have the tools, we have prayer, we have praise to engage in the pits that Jesus will send us and lead us to. As we we see Benaiah's first victory here against two uh, Ariels from Moab. Point two, write this down if you're taking notes. Church family, we can live by faith or we can live in control, but we cannot walk in both. We can live by faith. Or we can live in control, but we cannot walk in both. If we look at uh, 2 Samuel 23, 20b, the second half of that verse, we get another narrative, a, a single descriptive sentence of Benaiah's next adventure or his next exploit. The word says, and he went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. Okay, what? As I was studying this, I was like, in 2022 language, that's, that's like going to the zoo and, and, and stepping over the guardrail and hanging out with a lion from Africa in the zoo. Are you crazy, Benaiah? Bruh, that's, that's, that's a whole lion. And oh, by the way, the Bible gives us a description like his terrain it was not to his advantage. It's a pit, so it's probably a small area. And the Bible says it's snowing in this pit with a lion in it. Bruh. Okay, so I, I, I played high school ball, a little bit of college ball. And I can just, from an athletic perspective, I don't like to move fast and quickly in snow. It's slippery, it's cold, you can fall, it's awkward, it's embarrassing. And our brother is in this pit with the lion, with snow falling on the ground. Why would Benaiah put himself in this vulnerable, transparent place? He chose to get in the pit with a lion with snow. I love the Bible so much. I love the details. And this verse is extremely detailing the disadvantage, external circumstances Benaiah is in right now. Benaiah has no sense of control in this pit on a snowy day with a lion in it. And he had to go in there by faith to Salonja and attack and take out this lion. <laughs> I I believe that we cannot walk by faith and walk in control. And sometimes when Jesus leads us to take a step of faith into another pit, we're going to have to get out of our comfort zones and enter into a place of being weak. And can I suggest to you that actually the pits is where we can encounter the grace of God in a fresh, empowering way? Because Paul said, when I am weak, Then I am strong. Jesus said, my grace is enough for you, Paul, because it's in that weakness where my grace is made perfect in that place, in that pit with those thorns. I was looking at the IBB Bible background commentary, and they say this about this verse. So I say this and I quote, hunting lions was a favorite sport of kings and heroes. Both Egyptian and Assyrian kings chose hunting scenes to depict their manliness. One of the techniques used to hunt lions was the use of a pit. The lion would be pursued into the pit where often a net would be used to entangle it. The hunter would then go into the pit with a spear and finish the kill. The likely reason for mentioning the snow would be that it made the footing more difficult. Snow was not an altogether ex- extraordinary occurrence in the highlands of southern Palestine, end quote. I believe what this commentary is simply suggesting to us today, church family, is this. Getting in the pit is not easy, but we can encounter God's presence in the pit. We can encounter God's power in the pit. We can encounter God's provision in the pit. When, when, when my wife and I moved by faith from Huntsville, Alabama to Tallahassee, Florida, Again, we had no one coming with us. There was a mutual connection that we had in Huntsville, and they said, hey, there, there's a couple here that lives in Tallahassee. You may want to connect with them. And so when we moved into our new house in Tallahassee, Florida, I, I texted him. I said, hey, man, are you and your family available to come help us move into the house? He's like, yeah, dude, send me the address. 
and we have been praying for community and, and support, and, and we were like, God, we, we need help. <laughs> we're, we're going in this, into this new city with, with no clue and no people, no friend circles. And so the, the, the guy texted me back. He said, yeah, man, text me your address. And so I texted him our address. He said, bro, we're neighbors. I'm like, what? Where's your house, man? He said, dude, we're seven houses down from y'all. I'm telling you, when we follow Jesus into the hard places and spaces, he shows up. Because the gospel needs to be communicated and demonstrated in the pit. I, I didn't share this first service, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I think the Holy Spirit's leading me to share this too. We had another mutual connection from Huntsville to Tallahassee. And he said, hey, you need to connect with this pastor when you get in town. So we did. His name was Pastor Joel. And I met with Joel for lunch. We talked. We began to build a relationship. And he asked me, Aaron, what have, you been, what have you been praying about? And that morning in my prayer journal, I said, God, I would, I would love for Melissa and I to meet the mayor of Tallahassee so we can build a relationship with him, find out what the needs are in the community so we can love our city, begin to be present and just serve. He said, dude. The mayor's like my best friend. <laughs> we went to school together. I'll contact him. <laughs> the next week, the mayor of Tallahassee emailed Melissa and I and said, hey, I hear your new church planners in the city. Come meet with me and let, let's connect. We meet with him. We talk. We share. And he let us pray for him. And he began to point us in directions to begin to consider how we can begin to serve in the city. Can I suggest to you that God is faithful in the pit? For the sake of the gospel and the advancing of God's kingdom. Point three. God sent Jesus into our pit of brokenness. Will we trust Jesus to send us into hard, broken places for the sake of the gospel, the great commission, and advancing God's kingdom? Will, will, will we let Jesus send us into those difficult places for the sake of someone else receiving the gospel? You know, when you look at the next verse, 2 Samuel 23, verse 21, the word of God says this, Benaiah, he also killed an Egyptian, an impressive man. Even though the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaiah went down to him with a staff, snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and then killed him with his own spear. Benaiah's next exploit was defeating a ferocious Egyptian warrior with his own weapon, coming at him with basically a walking stick. Like, this whole verse is like a martial arts movie. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, the hero is under-equipped. He doesn't have the right weapons, and yet he's able to overcome an enemy who has an entire uh, uh, arsenal to, to take him out. I believe that as Jesus sends us into pits, we need to ask ourselves a very important question. What has God put into our hands? What do you have? What is he stewarding in your life? What gifting has he put in you? What, 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 what passions, what, what stirrings has God deposited into you? Because if, if we're going to be sent by Jesus into our brokenness, and into, the, into our pits, we, we've got to trust Jesus to send us into hard places. But he does not send us unequipped. He sends us with what he has put into our hands. And Benaiah came at this Egyptian with a walking stick and was able to wring away and wrestle away this dude's spear and killed him with his own spear. As we are church planning, I am discovering that God will take hard things and redeem it for the sake of other people's good. Where we can wring away what the enemy has done and say, oh, no, 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 no. The enemy has did this in this part of the city, but the Lord is now in this place. And we're going to take back what the enemy did, and we're going to say, no, the gospel will reign here. We will make disciples here. And we're not going to let what the enemy's doing stop us from bringing redemption as we join with Jesus as transformed disciples of Christ. And there's a key word here in this verse. It says, Benaiah went down to him. That, that word down is repeated again. It could have been another pit. A whole another pit where he was taking on this Egyptian warrior. He was willingly going to hard places for the sake of winning the battle to the glory of God. Can I suggest to you about something about the pit? 
God is really good at transforming us into pits. God is really good at renewing us in pits. God is really good at bringing redemption and healing and wholeness to whatever pit he leads us to. I look at y'all's facility and I hear the stories from Manny and Mark about what God's done here. It's a gospel provision here. But it may have been a pit before. And God sent people here to start a church plant here. What does God want to send you to? Maybe your neighbors. Maybe someone at your job. Maybe some of you, it's international missions or local uh, missions or regional missions. Maybe God's stirring church planting in some of you. Where God is bringing people and places to your mind that you know need the gospel. And we can overcome obstacles because we have been made overcomers in Christ. We, we, we can experience God's presence, God's promise, God's power, God's provision, and God's perseverance in the pit. Why? Because when we join Jesus by faith, he propels us into his mission. And I, I, I feel the need to say this. God will shape us as he sends us. He will shape us into the image of Christ while we're on mission. I can attest to that. God has been transforming my wife and I's marriage as we are making disciples of new people in Tallahassee. As we get ready to wrap up, I'm going to give you our, our last point today and look at the last two verses in 2 Samuel 23. Point number four says this. Promotion from God is not about prosperity. No, promotion from God is about proximity. Who does God want you to get close to for the sake of the mission? We see in the last couple of verses in 2 Samuel 23, 22 through 23, that Benaiah receives a promotion after all his exploits. Verse 22 says this, these were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehodiah, who had a reputation or honor among the three warriors. Verse 23, he was the most honored of the 30, but he did not become one of the three or the, the top three warriors. Instead, watch this. David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Even though Benaiah was not honored amongst the top three warriors of King David's mighty men, he was honored by God in his community for his courageous bravery. And God, through David, honored Benaiah's faithfulness. And he received a promotion to serve as a bodyguard. Now, please don't misunderstand me. When God promotes us, it's not about us. It's about his mission. When God promotes us and sends us someplace and we, we, we may get a, a role to, to serve, any title we receive, our titles are actually towels to serve others, to come alongside others and listen and love and pour the gospel to them. It's not about us. He invites us. He includes us. But it's about God working through us. I can remind you of the context of King David's life in 2 Samuel chapter number 7. God makes an eternal covenant promise with David. He said, your lineage will be an eternal lineage. And we know as we look through the gospel thread of the Bible that God brings Jesus through the line of David. Now, why in the world did God promote Benaiah to be David's bodyguard? Maybe with all those pits that Benaiah was faithful in, God used him as part of the gospel story to keep David safe. To keep the lineage protected so that the bloodline of Jesus, he could come be sent into our pits to save us. We look on later in the, in the text, in 1 Kings uh, 2.35, Solomon makes Benaiah his personal bodyguard. So, so, so God was faithful in keeping his covenant because Benaiah made a decision Get in the pit. And now we have Jesus who has come and saved us and brought us back to the Father through his death, resurrection, and ascension. Who does God want you to get close to for his mission? Who is Jesus bringing to your mind? Because you... You may be aware of some pits people may be in, and Jesus is saying, hey, come join me in this difficult place and experience my grace. Come, come follow me as I send you into new places and new spaces for the glory of God and the glory of the gospel so that the kingdom of God can advance in the hearts of people. 
I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And they're going to lead us in a song, and I'm going to return with some instruction. Because I believe it's time for us to respond. If, if my wife was talking to me and sharing her heart, and uh, I don't uh, respond back and let her know that I was listening, oh, foolish Aaron, foolish Aaron. <laughs> And I would suggest to us that I believe God is speaking very specifically. God is stirring something in the room. I, I sense it by the Holy Spirit. And maybe it's going to be a moment to, to respond. But let, let me read one more scripture in Ephesians 2. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And I, I want to read this verse because I want to remind us about our part in God's salvation story. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, CSB says this, For you are saved by grace through faith and this is not from yourselves it is God's gift not from work so that no one can boast for we are God's workmanship or his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works which watch this God prepared ahead of time for us to do that that word masterpiece or workmanship in the Greek means poema we are God's poem. He is writing his gospel story in us to transform us and through us for the good works he has planned for us to join him in. And those good works, some of them are in some pits. Will we be willing to follow Jesus and get in the pit with him? Because Jesus saved us from sin and for good works. So as the worship team plays this song, I, I, I encourage you to worship the Lord, but also posture your heart to hear what God's going to say to you. And I'm going to come back and we're going to respond together as a church family. Would you stand with me as you respond in singing? So I yield, so I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me a vessel. some of us, or maybe all of us, need to be reminded of God's love again. And maybe 
check our own hearts and to see if there are some things that are causing us a unhealthy hesitation to not join Jesus in his mission. Because it's, it's God's love and patience and kindness towards us that actually causes our heart to come to a place of repentance. Maybe some of us need to repent of, of fear today. Maybe some of us need to repent of, of some laziness that may have crept into our walk with Christ and his mission and making disciples. Maybe some of us need to repent of indifference where it's just like, ah, I'm comfortable. I'm, I'm good on Sundays gathering each week. And maybe God's saying, you may, may want to repent of that indifference today. Or, or maybe we just have comfort zones that we're not willing to leave quite yet. And maybe the Lord is saying, repent of that comfort zone and come follow me into a new place. Let me send you, transform you as I send you to make disciples in a pit where people need Jesus through us, through you. And as I'm praying, as I pray and just guide us into this time of repenting, I'm going to also invite those of you where God may be stirring in you just a heart to say, you know what, Holy Spirit, I, I want to walk in holy boldness and courageous love to get in the pit with Jesus. For some of you, God may be, may be stirring missions locally, regionally, or maybe internationally. Some of you, you're going to be sent to your workplace to start talking to people that God brings to your mind and brings to your attention, to begin to build a relationship and start sharing the gospel practically with your life and your words. Or, or maybe, like Melissa and I, God is stirring in here some church planners to go and make disciples of Jesus in new places and spaces. I didn't write this down in my notes, but I think this is from the Spirit as well. Some of our older saints, maybe God is about to send you as spiritual parents, gospel mamas and gospel papas, to start discipling the next generation who needs you in this dark, crazy, broken world. They need your wisdom, they need your experience, and God will send you to the ones coming behind you. And if that's you in any of those things or something else, would you take a baby step of faith and just come down to the altar? I want to pray an impartation of holy boldness and courageous love for you and over you. So let's bow our heads as we begin to pray. And as I pray, just follow the Holy Spirit's leading and just come take a step of faith if that's you today. And maybe even those online, just put it in the chat, say, hey, that, that, that's me. I'm sure someone online is going to be praying for you as well. So God, we, we look to your gospel where you loved us while we were enemies to you. And you sent Jesus into our pit of sin, our pit of brokenness, our pit of being enemies to you. And you demonstrated your love for us by sending Christ to die for us so that we can be reconciled back to the Father. Thank you for that love, God. May that love compel us and motivate us to get in the pit with you, Jesus. We, we repent of laziness, maybe. We repent of indifference. We, we, we repent of just going through the motions as a casual Christian. Mm. God, I pray that we would look to your kindness and, and maybe repent of apathy. Repent of fear. Because, God, you don't give fear. You give love. You give power. And you give a sound mind. So, God, we repent of those things. And we look to your gospel again. God, I pray for those that are starting to walk down. Hallelujah. For those online who are now surrendering again. God, in the name of Jesus and by faith through grace, I declare and prophesy holy boldness and courageous love over those who have come down, those watching online right now in the name of Jesus, that they will be sipped in holy boldness in the name of Jesus, that they will be sent in the courageous love of God in the name of Jesus, that we will live as a sent people of God with new wine and new power to see the gospel take ground in our families, our cities, our communities, our region, our state, our nation, and the world so that the kingdom of God will look to us and see Jesus as Savior baptizer of the Holy Spirit, healer, and soon coming king. So we receive this impartation, God, and we walk in this new wine. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Oh, so make me a vessel.